Federal Forces, the 1st and 11th Corps, to begin to fall back to this position. And that's kind of where I'd like to uh, begin. And of course, the technology that's going to make all of this key is the combat arm of the artillery. Frederick the Great, back in the 1700s, was fond of saying, artillery lends dignity to what otherwise would become a vulgar brawl. <laughs> Actually, it merely lends distance to what otherwise already is a vulgar brawl. And that distance is what the commanders in this case are going to be concerned about because distance and height and all those things are going to be key elements to what the commanders on both sides are going to be looking for as they begin to draw the key elements to what eventually becomes the Gettysburg Battlefield. And of course, Cemetery Hill, what is now artificially called East Cemetery Hill, the land on the east side of the Baltimore Pike, and to some degree, Culp's Hill will all factor into that. Now, the organization of the Federal Artillery, which is going to be key to all of this, will be broken down into, it'll be kind of subsumed into the layout of the core arrangement that the Federal Army has here. The Federal Army has seven corps of infantry, and the way that the Federals have smartened up after the Battle of Chancellorsville, when everything was a marvelous debacle uh, on the battlefield there, was if you wanted a concentration of artillery, you had to go from sub-commander to sub-commander trying to borrow a couple of cannons, trying to get a concentrated grouping of fire. They learned a little bit from that and they decided to create their own brigades of artillery and that would be from four to five batteries and a battery of six guns, usually on the federal side, so that you would have an automatic concentration of artillery and if you really wanted to concentrate that to an even larger grouping, you would be able to go and get those groupings more easily together. And the fellow who oversees all of this in this case is going to be a fellow by the name of Henry Jackson Hunt. Henry Jackson Hunt is the uh, chief of the artillery on the federal side, a West Pointer to be sure, actually a third generation West Pointer. And this fellow has a good eye for not only the technology but the terrain and has spent a great number of years prior to the outbreak of the war actually going through the army trying to train and upgrade the technology and the training in the American army prior to the secession of the southern states. But the folks that are in command of the brigades, as we call them, are severely underranked for the tasks that they have. They are usually uh, captains or uh, senior lieutenants and that puts them in a bad spot because they are kind of the little box inside the flow chart commanded by major generals. And that means that if the major general wants to do something else with his artillery, he is going to be able to easily and instantly outrank uh, that poor captain or lieutenant. So it's not necessarily going to be an easily done thing from the artillery perspective as far as that goes. From, from an organizational perspective, if a corps commander wanted guns here and um, Hunt wanted them elsewhere. Who had the, who had the final oh, say well, on that? Hunt immediate, well, that's that's going to be the the not in the flow chart, and right. that's going to be something they're not going to figure out for a long time afterwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but it does get to be one of the more grisly points of the story. Now they will also have reserves because of the fact that the North is much more industrialized than the South. They will be able to grind out these things, uh, the cannons, and be able to put artillery reserve uh, brigades and stock them way further down the line so that if there is a uh, particular need for folks that uh, they will be able to draw from those reserves, place them in different parts of the battle line. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But to start off here, uh, where we are, the summit of Cemetery Hill is roughly about 80 feet above the center of the town, about three quarters of a mile south of it. Now, of course, the day one starts off three quarters of a mile off in that direction with the contact between the Confederate cavalry, uh, the Confederate infantry rather, and the uh, Federal cavalry, Buford and all of those folks out there. But that's going to see the Federals pushed back to Cemetery Hill. And Cemetery Hill is not going to be barren of troops at that point because Governor Oliver, General Oliver Otis Howard will wind up having retained about a third of his force, one division, uh, 
myself on Steinworks, folks, will be left here along with one battery, six cannons of the uh, Federal Forces. And so they're not going to fall into a totally empty place here. They're going to fall back into the willing arms of their friends. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make a great difference. So when they begin to occupy this position, it's going to be uh, something of a uh, good spot for them. Now, of course, that's based on Howard's experience at the Battle of Chancellorsville when he was chased back by Stonewall Jackson. He did not have uh, something he could fall back to, something willing to receive him at that point. Now, Howard, uh, as he comes up here, uh, will uh, begin to uh, get the idea that this position might just be the key position, the only tenable position on the battlefield when he comes up here and takes a good look around. But this is also something that the officers have a good idea why and what the role of function of artillery is rather than infantry, which is very flexible in terms of attacking and defending. Artillery is primarily an arm of the defense. And the fellow who commands the brigade of artillery in the 11th Corps, a fellow by the name of Thomas Osborne, Major Thomas Osborne, will write in his papers later the artillery is in fact an arm of the defense rather than an offense. Its glory is in coolness and obstinacy. You know, it's very hard to go up against a line of artillery pieces, and as the Federals are falling back, that line of barrels posted on the high ground back here is for the falling back Federals a most welcome sight, and for the Confederates uh, a most unhappy one. <laughs> and so this is going to be part and parcel of the story. Uh, for the evening of the 1st of July. Now, General Howard uh, was already aware of those noises north and west of town, and he pronounces the Cemetery Hill, uh, as I've already discussed, uh, the most, the only tenable position here. So he will leave that one battery here. Now, one battery is actually going to be left on the far eastern, northeastern corner of Cemetery Hill, again, what the modern battlefield dividers uh, call uh, East Cemetery Hill but he will leave that one uh, battery, which is actually Weidrich's battery, uh, a battery primarily of Germans uh, from uh, New York. Uh, he will turn and ask them, boys, I want you to hold this position at all hazards. Can you do it? And a chorus of answers comes, uh, yes, sir. Now, there's gonna be some interesting things here. One of the things I love to do is go into the first person accounts here, and there's gonna be a couple of interesting folks that you're going to hear from today. Howard is one of them. Uh, he will write papers later. Uh, the other fellow is going to be the uh, artillery brigade commander of the 1st Corps. And he's a rather diff different sort of fellow. And uh, that gentleman is uh, the colonel commanding the 1st uh, Corps artillery. And his name is Charles Wainwright. Wainwright is quite the different fellow than, than uh, fellow commanding the 1st Corps than the 11th Corps artillery. Excuse me, I'm very jumped up right now. I, don't know why. <laughs> I haven't done this program in a little while. But it's my favorite topic. I'll get to it. Uh, Wainwright is a Western New Yorker, very rich fellow. Now, I see a lot of uh, white beards in here. <laughs> and so that tells me there are a bunch of folks about my age. How many of us in here remember Thurston Howell III? <laughs> okay, Thurston Howell III, and for those who are not quite my vintage, uh, Thurston Howell III was portrayed on television years ago as a very rich, snotty fellow. <laughs> and he is a very rich, snotty fellow. Uh, made his money in agriculture in western uh, New York, and because of that money, he was able to go overseas and play soldier, and he loved the artillery. He did not like peasants, which were people that had less money than he. He did not like, uh, uh, to be quite direct, he did not like African Americans. He did not like the Lincoln administration. He fought because he was trying to preserve the Union. So he has a slightly different attitude about a great many things. But one of the things he did, even though he was not a West Pointer, he had the precision in the eye of that kind of fellow. So his mentality on this kind of thing was a very sharp one. He would oftentimes rebuke the volunteers he had to work with when they were coming up in line if they were not in their 
this particular position and when you're a cannoneer you have to walk in a particular line they would straggle that would grieve him something <laughs> fierce he would yell at them uh, we'll hear a little bit about that a little bit later uh, uh, all of that sort of stuff but at any rate when the first corps begins to fall back of course there's a tremendous mess imagine how many of you have been to a ball game <laughs> okay what is it like if you stay to the very last play of the ball game and then everybody tries to exit at once? <laughs> okay, it's mess. All right, the ball game is finally over north and west of town and all the federal soldiers are fleeing down uh, Washington Street. They're fleeing down Carlisle Street, running into the town. It's the first really bad traffic jam in Gettysburg. <laughs> and they're all pouring through those uh, streets coming down this way everybody's rushing pell for mel right up towards the high ground up here is there going to be somebody in the middle here saying 11th corps go here first co first corps go here you think you're going to do that no it's just we want everybody up on high ground all the way up here so they have to make a spontaneous choice when they get up here who's going to command what units and that first spontaneous command is going to be Everybody that's going to be on the left of the Baltimore Pike will be Wainwright's command. Might be 1st Corps, might be 11th Corps, we don't care. <laughs> Your Union, you're over there, and this guy is going to command you. Everybody on the right side, which basically means in the confines of what we call now the National Cemetery on this side, is going to be commanded by Major Osborne. So that's the first real spontaneous command, and it's going to stick. That's just the operational plan that they've got for the moment. What did General Patton say? A good plan executed now is better than a perfect plan executed two days from now. <laughs> and that's what they're going to go with. Now, what I do want to do here for a little bit is, how many of you are not familiar with the intricacies of artillery drill? Okay, we got a fair few people here. I want to just run over a little bit of that with you because some of that's going to come into the story here a little bit. So we're going to head over... Uh, <laughs> all right uh, we'll we'll just all that here for a little bit but that's what they're going to be doing there have been some losses in uh, men and material out on the north and west of the field so we're going to take that into consideration uh, there will be ultimately around 41 pieces of artillery that are left from the battles north and west of town but we're going to break that down here in a little while the units are put up here now, of course, the thing of this is, with the cemetery being created here later, anybody here shoot? Or hunt, I should say. Okay, is it easier to hunt, and I'm presuming deer, we're talking here, nobody hunts squirrels. Uh, <laughs> is it easier to hunt uh, deer when they're on the top of the hill, when they give you that glorious silhouette <laughs> rack and everything else like that, or when they're halfway down the hill and it's harder to see? I'm sorry? Top of, the hill. Top, of the hill. top of the hill okay that's why when the artillery begins to move into position it will park itself along the mid slope of the hill here because not only will you have the guns themselves like we see on the monuments but you will have a lot of supply wagons you will have the caissons the limbers uh, all of that sort of stuff that will be right with the guns and the rest of it uh, is all going to be all littered all over the hillside here and all of that uh, will obviously be moved when the when the cemetery goes into position over here it's going to be a little different when you get to Wainwright's side of the field on the far side but what we're going to need to do is move over in this direction here for a little bit when Howard wanted to use this as a, as a fallback position did he send courage to the court to let them know that they kind of escaped this area for that purpose or not really. Yeah, he did. Okay. Yes. <laughs> now, actually, let me go where you guys are so that you guys can see what I want you to see back here behind me. Okay.
notice when we went just from that little distance down there up to here see how much farther you can see back over in that direction you can see all the way now bear in mind as well that this was a wheat field at that time this was clear none of these ancient and sacred trees <laughs> that the landscapers put in in the 1870s are here at that point in time so when the folks fall back as Hall's second main battery which had a heck of a time out there by uh, the uh, Chambersburg the Pike I'm sorry by the railroad cut yes by the railroad cut when they bring their guns into position here, initially three, they finally got that last one, bring it out and put it in here, and then lose it a little later on when they have more axle problems. Uh, but they will get up to this position. And if you look, again, with no trees out here initially, uh, so imagine yourself clear of trees, being able to see all the way to the trees along Seminary Ridge, you've got yourself a tremendous vista all the way out here to be able to protect the Tawny Town Road. Same thing up towards the northern portion of the Seminary Ridge, off in that direction, even towards seeing the town back over that way there. So this is a tremendous position to fall back to. This is portion of the ring, the bend of the fish hook, if you will, bending back over there and what we think is this massive cemetery over here, the Evergreen Town Cemetery, that holds so many of Gettysburg's residents past and present. Mm -hmm. uh, the folks over there, there's a very small grouping of folks. The cemetery's only been in business for five years and Gettysburg only had 2,400 folks in it at the time. And they're over in the higher portion of the hill over there. So the vast majority of that area over there is open and clear. And, yes. Uh, the uh, fence, of course, is not there yet. That's put in in 1879, so that's all open as well. And the only possible threat that's over there is Benner's Hill, and it hasn't announced itself yet on the evening of the afternoon evening of the 1st of July. So there are some uh, batteries stretching across there and actually occupying some of the area, some of the ground in the uh, Evergreen Cemetery area there. So you've got a good arc here because Federals don't need to know exactly where the Confederates are going to be coming from when they continue pushing down in this direction. They don't know if they are going to be con continuing that. So the idea is to use those 41 artillery pieces in something of a rounding arc over here. And what I want to do is kind of head up the road here a little ways as we begin to do that, kind of showing you the defensive nature, the defensive planning that goes into laying out a line of artillery pieces and a little bit of the technology that weaves into that. You know, anybody ever heard you can't shoot mosquitoes with a shotgun? <laughs> okay, this is kind of what's uh, coming into play with that. And now since we do have a gun that's somewhat in the shade, I want to talk a little bit about that for those folks that are a little less familiar. Now, When you're going around the battlefield, first off, not every gun that you see is real because uh, some of them, like this one, this one's a, a fake one that, the, that uh, was contracted to make up here. And you can tell that because this is a little more of a teardrop than a flat butt at the back of it. But at any rate, this is a replica of a three-inch ordnance rifle. These things have a range of about a mile and a half uh, when you lower the elevating screw uh, a bit more down but it's rifled on the inside, which means it's got uh, that good long range. And with a crew immediately around the gun of five guys and then a gunner, which would make it six, two more guys at the ammunition box, the limber back there, uh, 10 folks all together, you can actually load and fire this thing reliably once a minute, uh, more heavily than that if you're firing canister, which is a tin can within the case of a, a rifle gun, uh, approximately. 110 lead marble balls for self-protection because you'll notice this thing doesn't look like the uh, field artillery piece down back in front of the VFW hall back in the uh, <laughs> area where you live. So the whole thing rolls back when it fires. So uh, ideally that's what you would what you would use. And because there is no protection for the gun crew around here, everybody is cross-trained. <laughs> you would have the uh, number one and 
the number three, the number two, and the number four. They all have specific jobs to help load and fire this thing to get it done uh, and get it done rapidly. When, the, when you want to elevate the screw, elevate the barrel, you use this. There's another piece of wood, looks like a baseball bat, fits in the rings down here to adjust it when the gunner is looking and sighting on a sight that normally fits into a base and fits into the thing here. And of course, since it's a muzzle loader, the uh, sponge rammer pushes the thing all the way down here at the guidance of the number one man here. Uh, then you have a bunch of wire that is shoved down the vent, which is non-existent, which tells you this is a fake gun, uh, <laughs> down here. And then there is a small igniter, which would look about. this about like the ballpoint pen refill on your cheap ballpoint pens packed with gunpowder and a cross wire that is agitated when you pull that wire with a rope with a hook on the end of it that flashes ignites the gunpowder and sets her off and she goes off with a bang and that's pretty much the way that that would work no more open torches like they did in the uh, in their grandfather four in 1776 <laughs> So that's the way that that would work. And again, everybody worked it quite well because you don't want to set it off when there's a guy still inside between the wheel, between the muzzle and the wheel. Everybody wants to stay outside that when it fires. But it's well done, well drilled uh, as they crew together. So that's it in a nutshell. Any brief basic questions, yes? Yeah, when the, when the guy fires it, does he have to get out of the way real quick, or is he just standing there? The lanyard to... is long enough so that he's already out of the way. Okay. Are those barrels plain inside, or do they rifle? This is rifled. Most of the iron guns are rifled. Most of the bronze guns are smooth bore. And we'll talk more on that particular point in just a bit. How long could they fire before they would overheat, or is that not an issue? Uh, it is something of an issue. Uh, but something I don't think we'll touch on too much today. <coughs> Sir, what's the range on one of these rifle pieces? Uh, about a mile and a quarter uh, or so, given the fact that this is a three inch ordnance rifle. You know, and would have a pound of powder uh, to propel that. Now, there are bigger guns that you will see on the battlefield. You'll see them down by the, power, by the uh, tower on the uh, West Confederate Avenue, and that can launch a projectile uh, about uh, on a mile and three quarters. But it's got uh, a bigger bore and more powder. Is the gunner using instruments to, for his target or pretty much sighting it? From? No, you would actually have a seat uh, that, that uh, is actually drilled into here, and then you would have a, a removable gun sight with a weight. Uh, down here and you would actually have a front sight and the fact that this does not have either and the way the back end is tapered gives you that this is a fake gun but yes you would actually have those things and uh, when you're in uh, when you're coming up Hancock Avenue later on and you're touring around the battlefield and you're coming up that uh, section there it's possible at uh, that point from about a mile away uh, the uh, veteran gunners would be able to knock Robert E. Lee off his horse uh, from that distance uh, in about three or four rounds on a fairly windless day. Assuming he wasn't moving. Well, that would be the, I'm, I'm speaking of the oh, uh, Lee on his horse on the Virginia <laughs> Memorial. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that would have definitely ended the war. Well, it would have given a change. But at any rate, Large. so. We're just, uh, I want to wrap this up so we can continue to move down the way because as the batteries would fall back, they would fall back onto the, uh, the forward slope, not onto the crest like this, but a little bit forward so they could begin to be put into position. Some of them would be put down uh, a little bit further to the south, but again, facing the uh, seminary ridge where the Confederates were beginning to extend their line and some of them again up forming some of the bend in what becomes the fish hook of the battle line uh, as it moves over. But we're gonna head up this way. Now these guys are reserves here as well. This is Hill's West Virginia battery. Of course, West Virginia's <laughs> brand new to the, uh, to the outfit anyway. But uh, I did wanna highlight 
one little thing you guys don't get out of this without a something of an education on artillery um, you'll notice this seems to be a much more modern built up kind of artillery piece with that funky band in the back of it there the reason they have to do that is because the rest of that barrel is made out of cast iron now anybody who's ever had to deal with cast iron <laughs> knows that cast iron is very brittle and does not take pressure well think of the cast iron <laughs> pipes you have in your house in your basement going out to your yard all right cast iron will break it will fracture it will explode it does not take pressure well so anybody who's going to sell a cast iron cannon to the United States government is going to be able to pull off a great scandal and the fellow who does this is Robert Parker Parrott that's a Parrott rifle what he manages to do to make this legitimate or quasi legitimate is put a big wrap of wrought iron around the back of it to hold it together this is the Saturday night special uh, field <laughs> artillery in the Civil War. It manages to work in the 10 pound version where it's, where it's still only pulling a pushing a 10 pound projectile and only using one pound of gunpowder to do it. You go into the 20 pound versions or the 100 pound versions or the 200 pound coastal defense versions and the sucker's gonna burst. It's going to break apart. It's going to kill its own people. It's going to kill somebody it just does not care. And so uh, you will see those around the battlefield as well. But uh, and eventually in the 1880s, when the military academy is still using the 200 pounders to train people, it will kill cadets, and there will be letters to uh, the leadership to get rid of them because they're good boys. They're killing, and that's when they will finally cease and desist using them in the United States service. But at any rate, did both sides have them? Uh, do what? Did the Confederates have them too? Confederates had them too, as many as they could steal. Uh, they also produced them in uh, uh, in Trenton, so uh, and in some very smaller numbers in other factories. Uh, but uh, yes, they did produce them as well. Is that Richmond? Or, uh, That's an original. No, is um, Tredegar in Richmond? Yes, Tredegar's in Richmond. So that's just a little bit of. Uh, thing for you there. The originals they made in 2.9 inch, which meant that the projectile for that did not fit the three inch ordnance rifle. You could get a 2.9 inch projectile halfway down a hot 3.0 inch three inch rifle barrel and then it would stick even if it had been fired for a while and that's what ruined some of the artillery for the Confederates on the very first day's battle. Interchangeability of ammunition was not complete. Would it blow up at the end of it then? No, they realized they only got it stuck halfway down and they kind of took it to the rear and said, we'll fix this later. <laughs> <laughs> that is to say, we're not in position to do that right now. Yeah. <laughs> now, the guns we're at right now obviously are bronze. They are not uh, iron like the rifled guns. Iron guns are traditionally rifled because you can cut those grooves and you can make them spin like a well-thrown football and they will be accurate at longer distances. Bronze guns like these are smooth bore, smooth like a drain pipe on the inside and they will fire the round balls, your traditional round cannon balls like they had all the way back in the Blackbeard days <laughs> when all you have is solid cast iron projectiles and you will also have exploding rounds just like you have in the shells you will also have in the uh, in the iron guns you will also have canister and canister again is a tin can full of in this case out of the 12 pounders 27 cast iron golf balls to be used after infantry if infantry is coming close to you and that's going to be very useful Again, for self-defense, because again, none of these carriages recoil and you gotta have something to defend uh, against. But bronze guns are much more elastic. They will give, they will last a tremendous amount of time. The only thing that really kills a well-used bronze gun is the fact that with that round ball, when it fires, and it's, this thing takes two and a half pounds of gunpowder, is it will push that ball down into the bronze then it will rise up, then it will bounce down, then it will go out again. If you hear one of these things shot, you will hear more than boom, you will hear bing! <laughs> it sounds like a giant overpowered church bell. 
and eventually it will get so what they call it's balloting out the bore, balloting out the bore, and eventually they will have to throw the thing back in the melting pot and try and reuse it, or as much of it as they can. The thing weighs about 1,200 pounds, the tube does, and so that's what they do with that. 90 parts copper, 10 parts tin, give or take one part, and that's uh, what they do. But these things are, because they bounce out of the bore, they are short range, shorter range. You know, 1,750 yards, you know, around a mile, a little less than a mile, somewhere depending on what you're, how you're doing it. And so the rifles are the long range guns, these are the short range guns. And the canister is more effective, the canister goes about 400 yards. And the infantry always, the muskets the infantry has always go about 350, 450 yards. And so when you're defending a line, and you've got some of the area is open field, you want your rifles on the flanks where the open fields are, and you want your bronze smoothbore guns with its killer canister where the end of the town is, where the infantry of the enemy would be coming at you from a closer range. And that's why the bronze guns are more in the center of that little horseshoe. There's a tactical reason for putting them here, not just, oh, there's another battery, put it right there. There's a very tactical reason for doing that. So that is why all these guys are put here. Now, there was a question brought up by uh, someone out there about, uh, you know, problems with ammunition. Yes, the, the Federals and the Confederates had problems with ammunition, and we're going to get to that in a little while, but I just wanted to let you know that that's coming up because all of the things fired out of these guns did not always work reliably and there would be a problem with some of the fuses out of these guns, out of the smooth bores and occasionally out of the uh, rifled shells as well. So that's going to be a problem, but again, also you never had these things fight all by themselves. You only had them fight when there was lots of infantry soldiers on either side. You know, 300, 400, 500, you know, maybe a couple thousand muskets uh, will help you keep your position if you've got your guns because you've also got those vulnerable horses and, you know, you've got only a few barrels if you've got a lot of enemy infantry coming up and picking off your cannoneers and your horses because your horses are your motors. These things weigh a ton apiece and they're easily captured and overrun unless you've got infantry to support you on either side. Yes? Are you going to talk about mobilization and moving these and uh, they're done pretty much the same way that the other artillery pieces are. At the bottom of the, the piece that you see going down to the ground on the back hitches up to the limber and then is hauled around by the six horses. There's no way that men can move this? They can move it. It's, it's actually very well balanced. You can pick it up and run with it for short distances, but again it weighs a ton. But it is very easily balanced. Is, uh, if I get three guys and if I need to change the barrel off of that and I got a tree right there there's actually a rope that would be on the back of that trail and you can take that pop the cap squares off flip it up strike uh, take it and uh, tie it to the uh, to the tree easily like that and if my carriage is damaged or my barrel is damaged I can swap that out fairly quickly and get back into service and then push it with the wheels yes yeah it's, it's fairly easily done yes you said back there that they would fall back. They would move. How long did it take to move a cannon? I mean, could the three guys move it? It depended, of course, on the angle of the terrain. Right. You know, uh, when they're going up Little Round Top, they're going up because they have a lot of extra enlisted man help and also because their uh, adrenaline is uh, pumping with that. You know, so it's every feature has its own, uh, its own variables. But that took some time to move these, and when they said they fell back to a certain area, that took some time, correct? It would take a little bit of time, yes. But again, it depends on the circumstances, and that's one of the reasons why you don't go into battle without infantry support. Yes? How far back does the recoil? Again, it depends on the angle, but usually about uh, two, two and a half feet, okay. you know, on a flat plane. So if we fired this cannon, it wouldn't hit the fence behind it? No, it wouldn't hit the fence behind it. It would jerk, you know, maybe a foot there. And what a lot of these guys here were shooting at was actually nothing really at the base of this hill. It's going to be more over towards the artillery that is on Seminary Ridge, which is nearly a mile away uh, at this point, come the 2nd of July. 
the fact that the, Confe that the Federals are stringing this out to this point is going to be part of the deterrent factor why the Confederates decide not to do this on 1 July as they come up and begin to take a look at this position. But there's more to that story as we go, so we're going to come up in this direction. <laughs> This is the first season we've had where we've had numerous programs start at the same time at the same place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my first exposure to this was I did a battle walk uh, that actually began at 6 o'clock on the evening of the 1st of July. Oh. And yeah, there was a, uh, a tour of the National Cemetery that also began at that time, which is kind of what's going on like this. And then at 7 o'clock, there was the bugle uh, that went off at 7 o'clock in the National Cemetery. And so that was something else that they disrupted, of course. Uh, the three monkeys in the bucket you know, at the same time. So, at any rate, uh, down in this area here, looking across towards the base of where would eventually be the uh, New York State Memorial. Eugene Bancroft's regular battery of Napoleons was positioned roughly into this area. And of course, the Baltimore Pike is behind that, coming up in that direction. And Bancroft's battery had been known as Wilkerson's battery. And it's that battery of Napoleons that you'll see out on uh, Howard Avenue on the north and west of town. They had come back, and at that point in time, when they were positioned here initially four guns the other two that had cut their way around before coming back in would eventually rejoin them on the morning of the second so it was four guns at that point back to this position when they move into this area here they are positioned obviously because it's a connection back looking towards the city they're also going to begin to encounter the connection with the Baltimore Pike, and there are going to be a couple of other uh, units that will come up and do that. Hubert Dilger's battery of Napoleons will also come to its right, and those 10 guns, actually nine guns at that point, because Dilger lost a, a gun on the fight on the first day, so he's going to help block the access to the Baltimore Pike at that point as well. But as we move over in that direction, you're going to see where terrain is going to begin to play a part and concern about terrain is going to begin to play a part. Because as we've been up through here, it's all been about coming from the west, coming from the town. But as we begin to move over towards East Cemetery Hill, I don't know how many of you have been over to East Cemetery Hill. And I'm going to use just a modern label for East Cemetery Hill because it's been implacable in so many of the things I've read so far. Uh, how many of you have been over to East Cemetery Hill so far? Okay, then you know what awaits you over there. That sheer drop-off over there. One of the variables that the Federals are not quite sure about as yet is that how much of that Confederate force that pushed the Federals through the town have actually decided to split around and come up this way or are possibly going to come up that way. So they're going to have to split some of their artillery force and reconstruct it to be able to deal with a potential threat coming down this way or perhaps come down through the run and perhaps go even further around and outflank the federal position on the evening of the 1st of July. So this is a concern that's going to run through some of the minds of some of the men. It's going to run through the mind of Wainwright, it's going to run through the mind of, uh, the mind of Osborne. All these folks are going to be concerned about that. So we're going to take a look at that as we move down in this direction. So uh, just kind of keep that up because that's going to affect how the units, how the artillery is placed out here and what it can do. Because obviously field guns are different than mortars or howitzers because they're designed to reach out in a relatively flat pattern and do their dealing there. Obviously they're not, how, they're not mortars to go up like this and reach down and do depth down there. So that's going to play into it. So let's head out in this direction.
and Taft's Battery E of New York, or uh, fast, uh, fifth battery, excuse me, uh, fifth battery E, New York. Uh, they are going to, uh, one of the things you can do with an artillery battery is you can break it into segments. I'm sure in our uh, youth we all cut earthworms apart to see them fall in different directions. New York. Yeah, just like the, uh, just like the cooks at McDonald's. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yes, I still remember that Saturday Night Live special. Okay, but, uh, what you can do with, uh, if you have a battery of six guns, you have three sections in it. And those three sections can be positioned in different places in different ways. You have a left section, a center section, and a right section. And what they'll do with Taft is not unlike what they will do with different sections at different times. They will take one section of Taft and post him so that he fires. Notice the bus right there going down. See how the angle is there. We'll see it in a moment just again. But he has they have one section of Taft so that he can fire down the slope into the town should the Confederates make their appearance coming this way. The other two sections will be in the cemetery, high on the cemetery, so that so that if the Confederates make their appearance they will be able to use the long distance of those big powerful parrot rifles against any confederate appearance at a far distance. Now one thing about monumentation, monumentation depends on modern economics. Mm -hmm. Expensive cemetery plots outflank <laughs> poor old monumentation. Mm -hmm. So as you go down the Baltimore Pike, you will see four 20-pounder parrots right along the cheap slots right by the roadway. That's where they put the monumentation for Taft's battery. Nobody wants to get buried right by the road. It's noisy. You're not going to care, but it's disrespectful. So they decided to put those uh, four guns in that position just as a nod to the fact that, yeah, there were some guns up the hill. So that's the way it worked. But they were actually uh, on the higher ridge up here, but just facing to the east, but shooting in a different direction than these two guns shooting that way. So just to let you know that that's what's going on. I also happen to like their monument. You know, it's a miniature of that uh, 20 pounder parrot over the years. Numerous witless children have hung on it for various photographic purposes, uh, and one of them should be hung off of it. <laughs> so, I have a question. So I have a question. Yes. So this placement up here is right on the top of the hill. And you were talking a little bit ago about not putting guns right on the top. Sharp. Uh, they would probably have been halfway down the slope, about where the uh, parking pad is. Yes. Was this Taft any relation to President Taft or any of the other Tafts later I've on? I've not done the not? genealogy on that, but this is New York Taft and they were Ohio Taft. Whether okay. they drifted out into Ohio later on, I do not know. Okay.
Yeah, my, ger my German's not good. I don't know if that means shiny. I have no idea. Shiny, shiny, shiny. One of the things about actually coming out to a place as opposed to reading about it versus being on the ground is you get to see some really neat stuff when you're actually on the soil standing on here looking down a certain thing you know you can read the account of Howard and talking about his being on at what they called at that time Cemetery Hill and you can look down certain things and barring the impact of modern development you look right down this way you can look just atop the green long roof for the top floor of what used to be the Holiday Inn there and you can see that white fat toothpick sticking right up next to the tree right there and see very clearly the peace light out on Oak Hill and if the last two floors there weren't there, you'd actually be able to see more of the Oak Hill itself. And it's right there that from that vision that General Howard is able to get a good idea that this is the only decent spot for seeing the battlefield between this and the fact that some of this other development for the town is not yet here. Between what he can see here and what he can see from the upper portions of Cemetery Hill. Mind you, he's on that horse gallivanting about, and he's got a pretty good idea of what he can command from his troops and the artillery brigade of the 11th Corps. So he's got a good idea, but he knows he's got to send, at that early moment of arrival up here, he's got to send the bulk of his force out to the first day's battlefield, so he does so. But when he decides to leave his force here, that artillery battery that he will leave here will be the one battery that's going to cause the most trouble. And it's going to be very interesting because, as I said, there are going to be some differings of opinion between Howard and his artillery chief and Wainwright, the fellow who actually winds up over on this side of the Baltimore Pike commanding and writing his own memoirs. Wainwright, by the way, his memoirs were never intended to be published. He's a very private person, and uh, he actually doesn't do too much publicly post-war, and his memoirs go wind up uh, eventually in the uh, Huntington Library over in California, and they're eventually found in the 1960s and transcribed, and not terribly well. They're, they're done fairly well, but uh, the fellow who does that leaves out a couple of key important points relative to the Battle of Gettysburg. And then, uh, only have to be begged for by our library and the only good place you can find them. What I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, what happens over here. So we're going to take a little bit of a walk. Uh, let's go around this stone wall here and over to the far corner of the little field here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, Weidrick's battery is the battery that is left out here by Howard. To give you an idea, 
They're all from Buffalo, so this gives you a quick uh -huh. idea of their flag. This is what it looks like in modern uh, modern preservation. All that pink there would have been red, scarlet red for artillery. But they get brought out here, and of course, there's a lot of Germans. You know, a lot of Germans in the 11th Corps generally, but now they're going to be saddled with Wainwright. <laughs> and Wade Wright's kind of a, uh, you know, uh, politically incorrect fellow. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Wayne Wright doesn't particularly care for, you know, high Germans that speak German, uh, you know, in the ranks and all that sort of stuff. But when they get here, they're going to do some fairly interesting stuff. Now, you can't see too much because of the, what the Park Service used to put up as tree screens out here, but these trees were not here uh, at this point down this way, and you could actually look all the way out to the uh, old Harrisburg Road at that point, and one of the things that attracts the attention of the artillerists out here are parties of Confederates riding up and down the roadways out here, and on the morning of the 2nd, one of the things that they will do is uh, send a couple of artillery pieces out towards the uh, one little grouping of Confederate riders going up in that direction. And that will take out a key portion of the Confederates that are supposed to participate in the attack against Culp's Hill. And that's not Culp's Hill there, but it's uh, over in that direction. And that will keep uh, a number of Confederates from moving over into that direction. So that's going to be uh, something to uh, note. The accuracy of the Germans here is also pretty effective earlier on the first day because uh, if misplaced, it's still very accurate. They will actually go up and uh, take out a, uh, if not an impressive, a notable number of folks in the 17th uh, Pennsylvania Cavalry who they think are Confederates mm -hmm. on Oak Hill. Uh, and because, you know, if they think they're the enemy, well, that's a confusing thing. The fact that they hit them shows that they're accurate with their guns. Uh, and so both of these things tend to the accuracy of the guys with their guns and their German accents here. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting little thing to note here. But Wainwright's guns get pushed over into this area. Now, one thing about the earthworks around here, Wainwright, being somewhat European-inspired and European-trained, will know about lunettes whether they lost the lunettes that were actually dug on the other side of the Baltimore Pike in the creation of the National Cemetery or Osborne simply because he did not have the military background. Uh, I do not know if there were actually lunettes dug for those pieces as well, but one way or another, they did not survive if they were ever done there at all because uh, Osborne was uh, a graduate of Madison, later uh, Colgate College, on his way to becoming an attorney. So he didn't have the military background training that Wainwright did. But uh, these particular ones were, if there was anything left of them, were touched up heavily at the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. So we do ask that you not walk on them uh, at this particular point in time. But what I do ask is you walk past the base of the monument gently here to get a good idea of what's down in front. because there will be Colts Hill over to your lower and right. And you can see the lightning rod on the top of the Colts Hill Tower as a good indicator as to exactly what I'm speaking of. Now when those folks fall back, the jumble of 1st and, and uh, 11th Corps folks fall back to this area one of those batteries that's going to be in this area here is going to be the 5th Main. Six Napoleons will be in this area here. And not unlike 
the saddle between little round top and big round top, there will be a little bit of a gap between Culp's Hill and the area of East Cemetery Hill here. And there will be a little bit of a dispute depending on who you read as to uh, what takes place. But there will be an officer with a star on his shoulders directing one battery of artillery to go down into the gap down there and that will not be uh, 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 cleared up during the time of the battle but it won't be cleared up later there will actually be a little bit of an entry by Wainwright as to uh, not directing and not not yielding to any officer with a star on his shoulders as he says later to uh, uh, respond to that but uh, the 5th Main will be told to go in and take a position down on that slope. So we're going to go up here and just get a better look at that. You can see why now. Right. Because if they hit there and come right around uh, this side of the fish hook, if you will, to use that later term, mm -hmm. this is exactly what he's concerned about. Right. Yeah. And supposedly he takes uh, that one uh, regiment, breaks it into three sections at first, and then consolidates it. We don't have any written orders to fall back to as to go back and say out of the ORs that this and this and this was done. Mm -hmm. It was all on a fly-by-night, seat of your pants sort of thing. But that was very early on the morning of the second. Yes. Very early. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you uh, uh, did you read that little uh, brochure that was done about uh, Kinsey's Knoll and all that? Um, I don't think so. Okay, because there's a lot of it written up about that in there. Oh, oh uh, yeah. I was talking about Osborne's uh, reminiscences. Is okay, yeah, Osborne talks about it in there, and I think yeah. that's where Kinsey got, uh, not Kinsey, but uh, uh, what's his name, got his uh, thing out of that. Oh. And again, it's somewhat fleeting and uh, solid mm -hmm. footnote. Mm -hmm. But as you see, Culp's Hill sliding down in that direction, it does rise up again in a little hump. Mm -hmm. And that little hump becomes known as Stevens Knoll for the placement of the battery on that position. Now, right where that car is, right at the Y of the pavement right there, that regimental monument right there for the 33rd Massachusetts. And the 33rd Massachusetts will not be aware of the positioning of Stevens Battery just above it. Keep that in mind for something a little later on. But at any rate, in that way, the artillery will now cover the eastern front and the south, the southern quash southeastern front of the potential Confederate advance. Now, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what happens as the Confederates begin to try and hit, because at the end of the attacks on the afternoon of the second with Longstreet and his folks coming up from the west, you know, writing all of his people up like that. There will be attacks a little bit more uh, following that that will eventually begin to put a pressure on the uh, areas here. And not quite coeval with that are supposed to be attacks and actions coming out of Culp's Hill. And before that actually takes place, there is supposed to be an artillery softening of this portion of the line. And of course with that, we're talking about the bombardment of East Cemetery Hill. And that's going to mean that there's going to be fire coming out of a place that we cannot see altogether. And I'm gonna to have to ask your indulgence on this, but simply the trees just make it impossible to visualize. So if you look right here, at the cell tower. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know Route 15 goes from north to south in a semicircle around that direction. And the cell tower is roughly at the location of where uh, 116 and 15 intersect. So if you think of where we are as more towards the tip of a pie that's being cut with the large ends out there and the tips here, 116 is there and uh, the Hanover Road would be a little more to the north, but we can't see it because of that solid wall of green right down the bottom of the valley out there. Well, that would be, the Hanover Road would be where uh, 
the position of Banners Hill would be where the position where the Confederates are going to uh, line up with their artillery to begin to shell back into this direction. With the boy colonel. Yes. And that is going to begin the bombardment there. Now the fascinating thing to me about this is that Radio Shack is closed. <laughs> and what, what uh, gets uh, me about all this is that not only do Wainwright's guns here begin to go after him, but the Federal Artillery of Culp's Hill begin to answer, as well as smaller artillery units, sections of batteries that are posted down on Powers Hill and McMillan Hill down in that direction also begin to shoot up in that direction, a triangulation of fire. And normally it takes a radio or some other visual reinforcements for triangulation of fire, except maybe they're just using the smoke puffs to do that. But all of those different Federal artillery positions will begin to whack away at the Confederates and apparently do so with some success. And so that's something, you know, these people here get fairly well reinforced from that. And they're going to need it because the different batteries here are going to begin to suffer from that. Now, one battery that I've not made mention of is Stewart's battery of Napoleon's. And we just crossed, when we crossed, we passed them. And number one, not only did they have a bad time on the first day, uh, which reduced them in number from six to four, but they're also going to have a, uh, something of a difficult day on here. From Stewart's report, on the afternoon of the second day's fight, we received their shot front, right, and left. Cooper's battery, which is that monument right there, the one with the three inch ordnance rifle tube mounted on the top. That, by the way, is not their only monument. Their first monument is that glorified bird bath with the white head that you see there. <laughs> and when they opened, Cooper at once replied about the first shot blew up a case on, again, back into the green trees that we uh, blocked their position. I ordered my men to give a cheer for Cooper's battery. The echo had scarce died away when one of my caissons met the same fate. Then the hurrah was on the side of the Johnnies. It was the cleanest job I ever saw. The three chests were sent skyward and the horses started off on a run down towards the town. But one of the swing got over the traces, throwing him down and halting the team. Every hair was burnt off the tails and the mane of the wheel horses. Inquiring for the driver, the lead and swing driver reported, but it was some time before I found out anything of the wheel driver. Later, a man came to me with a piece of jacket in his hand and said, Sir, this is all I can find of Smith, the driver. About a month after, I received a communication from a surgeon in charge of the Cass Hospital, Detroit City, that Smith was a patient there and had entirely lost his sight. Now, you recall that I pointed out uh, battery, uh, the 5th uh, Battery uh, and the 20-pounder Parrot. Now, the Confederates had a battery of 20-pounder parrots along their position uh, over on uh, what we refer to as Benner's Hill, the position you can't see through the trees. And they would be very effective uh, into the area here. The thing of it is, from that position, some of them were almost firing laterally down the line uh, into the cemetery and not and into the area here as well. You know, on, this, on day two, Cooper's battery. Uh, and remember how I told you that uh, Wainwright would complain from time to time about the fact that his men would straggle and go off and wander around and would not stay in their assigned position in number behind the batteries, behind the pieces as they were marching. A shot from Latimer's 20 pounder exploded under the number three gun in their position killing Private Peter G. Hoagland and James McCleary and wounded Captain Joseph Reed, Private Jesse Temple, and, De and Daniel W. Taylor. Wainwright observed, one of the mortally wounded men was removed to the well, which is over by the cemetery gatehouse across the street that you see right over there. And he died there. Cooper came to me and asked permission for his brother, who was their bugler, to go and remain with him while he lived. The bugler, who had nothing to do at the moment, would not go 60 or 70 yards from his battery, battery to see his brother in his last moments without permission, nor would the captain give the permission without asking mine. 
Yet were they in camp, hardly a man would go off all day without permission to see a friend and Cooper would think it all right. Wainwright later commented, the man who was so bl badly blown to pieces lost his right hand, his left arm at the shoulder, and his ribs so broken that you could see right into him. He was removed to the well just inside the cemetery gates and died there. So that gives you an idea of some of the uh, fearsome bombard bombardment that these guys were in at that particular point in time. Now that was the afternoon bombardment before the assault against uh, Culp's Hill. That was a shell that came from the Confederates. It didn't yes. Have one of our screw ups. No, that was, yeah, we had a screw up later on, but uh, that was, uh, you know, that was one of theirs. Okay. Okay. Now, what I want to do is move up. There's a certain break in this point which will allow us to cross safely over the stone wall. Do you know where it fits? Anchor those rear seat studs a little better than the front one. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Just put the weight towards the back. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Now back off in that direction through all the kudzu, the trees, and the whatnots, and the wombats, and everything else like that. Uh, would be East Middle Street. Now East Middle Street was a portion at that time on the second day of July of the Confederate line of battle and as the attacks were being pushed forward it was part of that battle plan for those Confederate soldiers to swing forward and hit and assail the federal position here. So they would begin to come out this way. And as they began to came, come out this way, they would have to come across what at that point in time was a somewhat more open ground field out here. Now, how many of you may remember years and years ago, the supposedly notorious land swap between the park service and the college, the railroad cut and the whole nine yards like this. That is not the first of its kind. <laughs> years and years and years ago, there was a notorious, nefarious, uh, whatever good, bad, how you interpret it, land swap between the Park Service and the school district. So all of that area back over Lefevre Street was once Park Service property. And it is through that, part, through that old Park Service, now school district property, that the Confederates made that pivot to come up this way and approach the 11th Corps position. And the 11th Corps position fell back to the base of East Cemetery Hill where we are right now. And the folks of uh, then Gilsa were the troops that the Confederates would deal with. Matter of fact, the 17th Connecticut would be high amongst those troops that would be facing the Confederates as they came down through here. And to give you an idea of what was going on, uh, you know, down in the lower plain down behind me, you know, it was a fairly impressive thing because we have two Confederate brigades that would be making that advance coming across this way here in that lower field. Six North Carolina. Yes, this would be the North Carolinians uh, and uh, you know, Avery and, uh, yeah. and Hayes. Were we shooting our cannons at them? Well, uh, they did at first because at that point they were off in the distance. But you do have a problem because you can only adjust your muzzles down so low. And then at that point, you know, you do have a couple of physics problems because it begins to strain the carriages and things jump up like this and begins to do damage to the carriages and you just cannot do that. So that's when you have to worry about the support troops, i.e. the 11th Corps folks that are now behind you like that, and they begin to get pushed up uh, in this direction. You know, 
but there's also a you know a friendly fire begins to come in and unfortunately according to one writer at least one of the Connecticut men also fell victim to the close support the battery in our rear was giving them a warm reception lieutenant Milton Daniel recalled when the lead wadding from one shot killed one of our men which demoralized us worse than the enemy in our front but there would be some uh, individual acts of rather unique bravery and I can't help but share this one of them with you we had two men, one in Company C, George Wood, Jr., the other, William Curtis of Newtown, who were particularly noticeable for coolness. While the Tigers were coming across the meadow, George and Bill were sitting down behind the stone wall, and would you have supposed they were shooting at a target? I saw George shoot from a dead rest and heard him say, he won't come any further, will he, Bill? <laughs> then Bill shot and said, I got that fellow, George, and they kept that up perfectly, oblivious to the danger to themselves. But eventually those infantrymen had no further to go except back up through this way and they began to dissolve and of course that did nothing for the reputation of the 11th corps infantry that uh, was already known uh, and supposedly established through the rest of the army of the potomac but now with no infantry support and the artillery not really in a way to do anything at this point either all that was left was for the uh, Federals to endure what was going to come at them. Now, this was not the way for the entire field out here. And the reason I brought you right down the spine here was because you can see it's going to be different on the left than it is on the right. Remember, we have the 5th Main out here. And the folks in the 5th Main have been practicing. And uh, not necessarily here, but prior to this particular uh, indication and they were taking range uh, they had actually been taking range at uh, previous occasions and let me get that uh, up here for you because there had been some uh, notation about this the first salvo from the fifth main the order case shot two and a half degrees three seconds had hardly been heard before up went the limber lids Fuses were cut in another moment and the guns were loaded as if on drill. Slap went the heads of the rammers against the faces of the pieces, a most welcome sound, for at the same moment came the order, fire by battery, and at once the flash and roar of our six guns, the rush of projectiles along the face of the enemy came charging. Every case shot, long range canister, burst as if on measured ground at the right time and in the right place in front of their advance. They had pre-ranged the field, French ordnance glass, ranging shots, etc. And what that did was to cause a great number of casualties all along the left portion of the Confederate assault. But again, with the rise in the hill, it did mostly damage to the left portion of the Confederate assault. The right portion, that is to say the other side of this rise here, was able to be more effective coming up into Weidrick's battery, you know, Hayes' people were able to get uh, up into that area. Anyway. And, you know, all of this, because it's a great deal, 11th Corps would be later commented on by Wainwright, you know, and we'll get into that. I said to General Howard, why don't you have them shot? The general answered, I should have just shoot all the way down, they are all alike. <laughs> <laughs> it was rather cruel, but uh, nonetheless, that's what uh, that's what he commented on. So the 11th Corps was not doing their job in in his uh, in his uh, in his mindset, yes. Because okay. they were in trouble from um, Chancellorsville and from yesterday. Yes, yeah, and from the second. So what I want to do is kind of have us go uh, turn about and head back up, make it up to the Union line. Of course, they desperately wanted a couple of things. They didn't necessarily want the guns as badly as they wanted to be able to park over there <laughs> because the Baltimore Pike was the main supply route for the Union Army that led back to Westminster and at Westminster was the rail connection for the Federal Army. All the food, all the military, all the uh, medical all the uh, good things connected back in that direction and if they could sever Meade's army from the railhead at Westminster 
then they could really begin to move in for what they hoped would be the kill. And that would have military and political implications. You know, a lot of people always talk about the high water mark, the high water mark, the high water mark. This could be the potential high water mark. And they were 400 yards from it. But they didn't have the manpower. You know, there was some intense fighting up here. Some of those artillery pieces that could not aim down and could not discharge were fought over viciously. Now, you know, Harry Hayes talks about this. Here we came upon a considerable body of the enemy and a brisk musketry fire ensued. At the same time, his artillery, of which we were now within canister range, opened upon us. But owing to the darkness of the evening out now verging into night, and the deep obscurity afforded by the smoke of the firing, our exact locality could not be discovered by the enemy's gunners, and we thus escaped with what in full light of day could have been nothing other than a terrible slaughter. And there's a great account by one of the fellows who talks about uh, what it was like uh, being up here, and I'm trying to find that particular one. I see my notes are not quite in the order I thought they were, uh, which is always a terrible thing. But if I can find this quickly, I will get to it because it's rather uh, a humorous bit in the terror battle. Okay. Yes, here we are. Uh, at one of the guns of Weidrick's battery, a Confederate of Hayes' brigade, this is why confusion in battle is a terrible thing. A Confederate of Hayes' brigade threw himself across the muzzle of one of Weidrick's guns and announced, I take command of this gun. <laughs> <laughs> to this, a cannoneer holding its lanyard replied, Du sollst sei heben, which means, then you must be lifted up, yanked the rope, and blew the Confederate to kingdom come. Uh, but it was a very intense fight between the two forces along the battle line at this point. And one of the things that helped put the knockout punch into the, con into the Confederate claim of any uh, shade of the battle line was the timely arrival of Carroll's brigade of uh, the 2nd Corps, which had come across the Baltimore Pike, swung around, hit the right, or actually uh, hit the left, of the Confederates, drove them across, and pushed them back down the hill. The arrival of that helped give the final kick to the Confederate claim to this and push them back down. That was the anchor for the Federal hold on this position. And with that, this was going to be a secured position and all Confederate hopes of uh, claiming the Baltimore Pike or the Federal position here would be denied. Now, one of the things that's always intrigued me as we look up here to the monument for Carroll's Brigade and the West Virginia soldiers here is, you have a, why is he in an overcoat? <laughs> you know, it's the 2nd of July. You know, now, this is now an anchored position, and the Federals now have total and complete control of it. And it is now secured. It would remain for the third day of July to ultimately grant the Confederates the confirmation that this close but no cigar was just not going to happen for the Confederates here at Gettysburg. But just how close they had gotten was painfully obvious already on the evening of the 2nd of July, 400 yards away from the main road leading to the Federal rear. Didn't they hear um, wagons and they thought they were um, retreating? There was but some... There was just all the coming and going. There was some discussion of that. There was some discussion of that. But that pretty much concludes my program for you today. If you have any questions, any comments, you're welcome to stick around. I'll do what I can to answer them for you. Uh, there are other programs that await you today, and again, good morning. Thank you. Thank you.